a dialogue. Maybe the answer should have been, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to those workers and we're going to talk about what this transition looks like and what this means for their communities and for their families and for their paycheck. Instead of just saying, here's here's something you can do. I, you know, <laughs> that never works in economics. To tell people what they're going to do. Welcome to MCV Cast. That was former U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota on reopening the dialogue with rural America, especially when it comes to tackling our changing climate and our changing economy. We'll hear more from Senator Heidkamp about the One Country Project in a few moments. I'm Aaron Murphy here with Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters, Whitney Tani in Bozeman, and in Helena, Political Director Jake Brown and Program Director Whitner Chase. This podcast covers the intersection of Montana politics and conservation. Most lawmakers who hold the majority in the Montana legislature told voters they were focused on jobs and government accountability, personal freedom, and protecting our public lands. But lately, they focused on the opposite. Here's one of MCV's lifetime champion, State Senator Bryce Bennett, talking about another controversial bill called the Montana Religious Freedom Restoration Act on Tuesday. I'm an LGBT person. You know that. This bill is very personal to me. And the testimony that we heard today was personal to me as well because I have lived those experiences. This bill would allow people like me to be denied housing, to be kicked out of restaurants, to be denied health care, to be fired from my job, not because of something that I did, but simply because of who I am. I want you to look me in the eyes and tell me why you deserve a life free of discrimination and people like me don't. The legislation Senator Bennett is talking about is Senate Bill 215, sponsored by Republican Senator Carl Glim of Flathead County. Glim claimed Bennett's examples of discrimination in the name of religious freedom wouldn't apply, but you decide whether his argument holds water. All this bill does is gives a, an ability to use religion uh, in the court of law and those those arguments that that you are are referring to would have to then be be worked out in the court in addition to this bill montana's republican-led legislature is also hard at work outlawing rights for transgender people making it easier for people to carry concealed guns limiting reproductive rights and making it more difficult to develop renewable energy jake and whitner are in the middle of all of it guys what's keeping you busy Murph, let's start with uh, renewable energy in House Bill 359. This is legislation from Republican Representative Larry Brewster of Billings. It has to do with net metering, which is the ability for people in businesses that generate their own power from, say, rooftop solar panels to sell that surplus power back to the grid. House Bill 359 would drastically scale back this benefit to solar investment, reducing the payment to solar panel owners for the sale of their energy by 50 to 70%. This is a dangerous idea because it would essentially take money out of the hands of Montanans who have already spent thousands of dollars investing in renewable energy improvements for their homes or businesses. But there's a good piece of legislation we're asking Montanans to support. House Bill 387 also got a hearing this week. It comes from Democratic Representative Ed Staffman of Bozeman. House Bill 387 saves consumers money and cuts carbon pollution. It does so by preventing utilities in Montana, like Northwestern Energy, from contracting with power production facilities that emit more than 1.2 metric tons of carbon dioxide for each megawatt hour. And of note, Northwestern Energy did not come in to oppose this bill. We support this bill because it's pro-business, pro-customer, and pro-clean air. Here's MCV endorsed representative Ed Staffman. So it's time to move into the 21st century. And more important, it's time to save our ratepayers a ton of money. I don't think there's a single tax break that this, uh, that, that this body, the legislature, can give to Montana taxpayers that will amount to the kind of money we, that ratepayers stand to save from this bill if Northwestern Energy is able to implement it. We've spent several weeks following House Bill 176, which would end same-day voter registration in Montana. 
The legislation moves the registration deadline to Monday before Election Day, even though many Montanans register and vote up until the deadline of 8 p.m. on Election Day. This week, HB 176 got its first hearing in the Senate, and Montana's very new Secretary of State, Christy Jacobson, took to right-wing radio to defend the controversial bill. She blamed the need for this voter suppression legislation on the fallacy of voter inconvenience. It's to um, protect the people that want to vote in person on Election Day, and so they don't have to stand in line for hours and hours and get you know, give up and and decide that they they're not going to cast their vote because they're standing in line um, for hours on end. And we did see that we had a lot of feedback from um, Flathead County and from Yellowstone County about lines and the people that had registered in advance and um, just it, it being a, a you know it's been discouraging for the voters. This week, Senator Steve Daines tweeted a picture of a frozen wind turbine in the context of record-breaking cold weather across much of the country. He wrote, quote, This is a perfect example of the need for reliable energy sources like natural gas and coal. If Senator Daines stuck to facts, he would have noted that the concern has nothing to do with wind turbines and everything to do with America's aging electrical infrastructure as it relates to climate-related crises. In fact, Texas already relies mostly on natural gas for power and heat, but the equipment needed to do that is not designed to withstand such low temperatures. Montana Congressman Matt Rosendale also took to the airwaves this past week to gripe about President Biden's order to halt the Keystone XL pipeline. It's a real, real shame. We lost 200 jobs on day one. We're looking at losing up to $80 million on the first year lost tax revenue from the Keystone XL. And you guys know. That's going through some of the most rural areas of the state over there, you know, by my ranch, right, going right through Dawson County. That was Rosendale on KGEZ Radio holding on to the notion that some temporary jobs justify the construction of a pipeline to ship foreign oil to the Gulf of Mexico to be delivered to other foreign countries. And here we should note that Matt Rosendale is still referring to his property near Glendive as a ranch. In 2018, Montanans learned he never actually registered any livestock. In other words, he's not an actual rancher. The U.S. Senate's Energy and Natural Resources Committee has scheduled its confirmation hearing for Congresswoman Deb Holland for Tuesday, February 23rd. Holland is President Biden's nominee to serve as Secretary of the Interior and is the first Native American nominated to a cabinet position. Both Steve Daines and Matt Rosendale are still opposing Holland's nomination saying she's too radical for the job. This week, MCV joined nearly 500 other organizations and businesses around the country in expressing our strong support for Congresswoman Holland's nomination to congressional leaders. The letter, which you can read in our show notes, says Congresswoman Holland is highly qualified as a nominee. It goes on to say she will be tasked with rebuilding the agency in an intentional way that reflects the diverse demographics of our country, creating more equal opportunity for all Americans to enjoy our public lands and waters, and rooting out sexism, racism, and white supremacy from the people and the systems which govern our national parks, refuges, and forests. Here in Montana, nine members of the American Indian Caucus in the Montana legislature also weighed in. They wrote a letter to Danes and Rosendale saying their opposition is, quote, deeply offensive to all Native Americans and the generations of indigenous people who have lived on the land and managed it sustainably for generations. This past week, the U.S. Interior Department repealed a controversial order by former Secretary David Bernhardt. The order required state governors or local jurisdictions to approve, in writing, of public land acquisitions made possible by the popular Land and Water Conservation Fund. MCV praised the decision because it will ultimately mean more access to more public land and water. The old order just created more government red tape and essentially rewrote the Great American Outdoors Act, which fully funds the LWCF at $900 million per year in perpetuity. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is predicting a dramatic increase in farm income in 2021. In fact, this year's income could be as much as 20% higher than the 10-year average. 
The USDA says the increase is due to higher market prices, crop and livestock recovery, and higher federal payments to farmers and ranchers. The increase is sure to be a boon for rural America. The cultural divide between rural America and the rest of the country, however, is wider than ever. This week's guest is hard at work trying to bridge that divide. Senator Heidi Heitkamp served neighboring North Dakota in the United States Senate from 2013 to 2019, the first female senator ever elected from that state. Before her service in Washington, Senator Heidkamp was North Dakota's attorney general, and she's the co-founder of the One Country Project, whose mission is to reopen dialogue with rural communities, rebuilding trust and respect, and advancing an opportunity agenda for rural Americans. She joins us from her home in Mandan, North Dakota. Senator Heidkamp, good hearing from you again, and welcome to MCVCast. Thanks so much for having me on, Aaron. You bet. Let's start with the One Country Project, which you co-founded with former Senator Joe Donnelly of Indiana. As fellow rural staters, we're curious to know what exactly One Project is doing, how and why. Well, we started out after, actually, this was a trend that I started noticing um, back in the mid-2000, the the first decade of uh, 2000, when you saw previously reliable voters starting to not be so reliable um, in terms of their votes for the Democratic Party or for Democratic candidates, thinking, you know, this is probably temporary, you know, that there's just some glitch. But uh, over over the period of probably about 15 years noticed and an alarming trend, I think, alarming on a couple levels, alarming for the Democratic Party, because it's going to be very, very difficult to be the majority party with this kind of disaffected uh, uh, voters, uh, with this level of disaffection of voters from the Democratic Party um, in rural America. And so when I ran in 2012, um, you could get about 20% of the known Republicans to at least consider voting for a Democrat. When I ran for re-election in 2018, it was only four. So that reflects kind of a tribalism that's going on across the board, not just in rural America, but the the numbers are particularly alarming. And and it always kind of hurt my feelings, I will tell you, because I thought, but we did the New Deal and we're we're the authors of the Farm Bill and and uh, rural electric movement and now the broadband movement. We're there for rural America. Why is it that rural America feels like we're not? And so when I um, wasn't able to get reelected in 2018, um, I thought, what what political issue do I want to work on? And and it just came to me very, very clearly and enlisted the support of my good friend, Joe Donnelly. And we started One Country that I say kind of um, it's to reintroduce uh, the Democratic Party to rural America and rural America to the Democratic Party. All you have to do is say socialism, and they think Democratic Party really does support socialism. And why is that that they believe that? That's because we don't show up and tell them what we do believe. So you've always been a no-nonsense, straight-talking leader. So we're curious for your perspective on what it takes to reopen dialogue with rural America. What's causing the disconnect between rural states and non-rural states? A couple things from the 2020 uh, election. Um, Joe Biden did better than Hillary Clinton, but Donald Trump did better than he did in in uh, 16. We had record voter turnout in rural America. Joe, uh, Joe Biden um, outperformed Hillary, but yet lost by, in many places, higher percentages and, and actually um, won his election with fewer counties and uh, voting for him than any other uh, president in history. Um, so I would love to be telling a different story right now um, after our initial uh, uh, period, you know, first first look back of our work. Um, it just means we have a lot of work to do. And so how does, how does that uh, happen? Number one, not set expectations too high. People always kind of roll their eyes. I said, I'm not telling you that the Democratic Party is going to become the majority party, but I'd love rural America once again to be 60-40. Um, as opposed to, in some places, 2080, 2575. And so um, it's going to take showing up. Um, It's going to take an ongoing and realistic dialogue. And it's going to also take understanding of the demographics and the demographic changes of rural America. 
you know, my great hope is that um, where we've seen rural America and healthcare particularly decimated by the pandemic, we also have seen that people can work from home, that there's a lot of things we can do in rural America that would benefit major corporations in Seattle and and San Francisco and New York City. And so um, to build back economic opportunity, but this isn't just about economics. Um, people want to put it all on economics, say, oh, they feel disenfranchised and, and uh, you know, underappreciated and, uh, you know, economically. And I say, look, um, if I had to sum up the disconnect, I would say it in one word, respect. Rural people believe that urban elites, which they equate with Democratic Party, are uh, disrespect them, do not appreciate their way of life, don't know how to talk to them. And, and we've got to get back to identifying everyday Democrats and why they're Democrats and why they have experiences that are really consistent with a lot of people in rural America. Senator, the One Country Project is at work in 11 states, including Montana, and all of them have significant rural populations, and most of them not considered blue states. Uh, appreciate what you're saying about respect, but uh, you've been pretty outspoken about health care, the economy. Uh, public education as it applies to rural states. Where do you differ from the mainstream of the Democratic Party and, and why? I would say it's not about what issues we need to tackle, but it's about how we approach it and how we approach our discussion about it. You know, I, I got in a small amount of trouble when I said, look, I believe in global warming. I believe that that this is man-made. Do I think that you can just go out and say Green New Deal and everybody's going to jump up and down and say, yeah, I'm for that, when you don't explain what it is. You don't tell um, coal field workers, which you have in Montana, we have in North Dakota, you don't tell oil field workers what their future looks like. And it's almost like, well, I, I will tell you the greatest example recently was uh, a very high positioned uh, Biden official when asked, what, what do you want oil field workers to do? He said, well, they can build solar panels. You know, that is like, fingernails on a chalkboard to people who work in the oil field. Um, it's like, really, dude? I mean, you have no idea what our skill sets are. You have no idea what, um, uh, you know, what we're capable of. And, you know, we, it, it, this idea that rural America doesn't believe in, let's say, global warming is ridiculous. And, and so, you know, my point is, let's have a dialogue. Maybe the answer should have been, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to those workers and we're going to talk about what this transition looks like and what this means for their communities and for their families and for their paycheck. Instead of just saying, here's here's something you can do. I, you know, <laughs> that never works in economics. Tell people what they're going to do. Ask them what they want to do and then figure out how you're going to achieve that. Many of these people, very entrepreneurial, very willing to take business risks. How do we build an environment that allows them to do that? Uh, light manufacturing, many of them, incredible welders, could could be part of that all important uh, resurgence in manufacturing supply chain. And and how do you get people to recognize those are opportunities that should be and will be available where they live? So so to me, this is about respect, but it's also, as you know, it's about culture. And and um, the the Republican Party will always use, you know, they're going to take away your guns. I, I just think it's just, I mean, I, I always ask people, so President Obama was president for eight years. How many of your guns were taken away? You know, and, and it's the Democratic Party plays into it by not responding in a way that tells people, look, we're, it's not what we're doing and advertise that in a big, bold way. Um, so I, I think I think that um, we're in we're in the process of some major demographic changes that has created a whole lot of unrest and unease among uh, a lot of people in this country and a lot of people in rural America. How to Tell people where you're leading them. Don't just say, trust me, we've got the, got the path set. You've said that folks in rural America feel like they're treading water economically and that the economy is not working for small towns and Main Street. What's the solution in your mind and where do we go from here? I think the solution is diversification. You know, in North Dakota, we're so heavily dependent on commodities, whether it's oil, uh, electricity, or um, corn and soybeans, cattle. Um, you know, we can't build a future in our state and a future that will provide opportunity to innovative, creative, brilliant uh, North Dakotans who, are, who we graduate out of our institutions, whether it's high school or whether it's college. 
we've got to build opportunities for them to do things uh, that is uh, recognized and it is part of the new economy. Um, you know, it's interesting. This has been the mantra for uh, North Dakota politicians. And I'm sure the same is true for Montana politicians for generations, you know, diversification. Let's get serious about it. Let's let's find out why we haven't been successful in the past, past, quit doing what hasn't been successful and start moving forward with real plans. Um, Montana is, I think, a great example. People always say, well, you know, John Tester got reelected and you didn't. And I said, well, Tester is probably just a better politician than I am. Um, but, you know, um, it was pretty hard that the, the case they were making against John was that he wasn't Montana. Man, you look at John, he, everything about him is Montana. Um, how he talks, how he walks, said, you know, is common sense. But Montana is something North Dakota doesn't have. I always say, you know, Eastern Montana is not very different at all from Western North Dakota, and they both both the same. But Montana has a thriving and growing tourism business, They've, they're, they're using their natural resources to attract um, uh, uh, visitors to their state. That's value added. They're looking at what they can do to bring uh, high tech. And, and you know, I think we need to do things regionally um, with Montana and South Dakota and Wyoming, all of, all of the great upper Great Plains states that have really been decimated uh, economically and figure out how we can work regionally. And that's why that's one of my big regrets of not getting reelected is I don't have a chance to work with John on on issues like this, but we'll keep plugging away from the back bench um, uh, and and work with one country to try and uh, illuminate a path forward for economic growth in rural America and diversification of opportunities, which will lead also to diversification in our politics. Senator, we'd be remiss not to talk about the news of the moment, which includes the impeachment trial of former President Trump and his acquittal. And curious for your thoughts and perspective as history looks back on his presidency uh, and as America looks toward the future. Well, I, I think it's interesting because everybody is focused on on the acquittal. Um, by that, I mean they're focused on the not guilty vote. I chose instead to focus on one person to give me great optimism, and that's Lisa Murkowski. You know, you, you can say what you want about the other seven. Um, two are retiring. Three just recently got reelected. One is is up in uh, 2026 and has his own persona, right? Um, so there's one person who stands out who's a true profile and courage, and that is Lisa Murkowski. I just wish everyone in the United States Senate had her integrity. I, I, I mean, and, and, and she should be lauded over and over again. You know, I don't know what kind of um, injury this will do to her reelection chances. I hope none up in Alaska. But when people see her courage, I hope it inspires courage in others. And so far, we haven't gotten that kind of political courage. You know, it's amazing. I don't know why they want those jobs so bad that they're real, willing to let someone storm the Capitol and suffer no consequences so that they can get reelected to do even less for the country. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing, <laughs> you know, when you think about it, you know, and, and then you have to think what motivates them. It's got to all be ego. It can't be principle because anybody of any principle wouldn't have voted this way. Thank you for saying that. So as a key voice in agriculture and looking through the lens of rural America, how do you think the conservation movement can better speak directly with people who make their living off the land as we face down climate change? I always say this about farmers. Don't tell them what you're going to do to them. Tell them what you're going to do with them. And I've been with farmers who are doing conservation and have become absolute disciples of the work that's being done in conservation and, and the relationships that they've forged, but also economically what that's meant for their operation. And so um, I'm also, as you know, involved in a project that I'm really proud of, um, the Bipartisan Policy a, a group, the center has initiated a, a, a project task force to study um, climate and forestry and agriculture. And a lot of that is going to talk about sustainability. And I think you're going to see a lot of great ideas coming out about conservation, about what we can do to help um, preserve our water quality, what we can do to uh, reduce the use of water especially in the West, by using better soil practices. And so I'm very, very excited about it. And I think this is where the rubber is going to meet the road for that intersection. And I think 
conservation in North Dakota and agriculture got off to a bad start because there wasn't that level of communication and, and people feel like things are being done to them, not with them. And so I think there's a real opportunity with the next generation of farmers and ranchers to talk about what, what, what does that look like and how can we work together? And, you know, I will say this, uh, Farmers, he, he, this is again about respect, you know, when they're told, well, you're wrecking the land and you're not doing this and doing that. They've been taking care of this land for generations. Yeah, you know, is it always perfect? No. But but to, to assume that they purposely want to hurt the, the land and the, the place that they live is, is, is a non-starter when you start there. And so, again, it's about approach, language, and then don't come empty handed. This got to be a win-win, win for conservation, which also is a win for sustainability, a win for climate, and and a win for the for the people who own the land. So it, it's interesting. I am a, a voracious uh, property rights believer. Um, I, I once got in a debate about um, uh, production of natural gas, um, and and I was listening to this debate, and finally I just looked at my. Uh, people who were opposing my position, I said, you do know that the government doesn't own those minerals in this country. This isn't Canada where the crown owns the minerals and can make the decision. I said, those minerals are owned by people. And, and so they get to decide what they're doing with their property. And, and so I think if we approach all of these issues from the, the way of respect that this is their property, and we are asking them to do something different with them, with, with their property. And, and how do you persuade them? How do you get them to kind of move forward? And I think we can, we can achieve great result if we approach it with respect for private property rights. Anything you'd like to add, Senator? Um, I think we didn't get in this hole as Democrats <laughs> in one cycle. We're not going to get out in a cycle. But, but we absolutely have to prioritize this dialogue as a major initiative within the Democratic Party and, and honestly within public policymaking in Washington. And I have great hope, I have great hope that Joe Biden is going to do that. I, I saw a pretty robust um, outreach during the campaign. I know there's a lot of talk now. Um, I, I, I'm seriously happy about uh, the outreach and the immediate um, dialogue with Indigenous people. He's going to do a um, a major event with Native leaders in March. That is exciting to have the president himself engaged in that. And the president himself needs to be engaged in rural America. Heidi Heidkamp is a former U.S. Senator for North Dakota and the co-founder of the One Country Project. Find One Country online at onecountryproject.org and on Facebook and Twitter. Senator Heidkamp, thanks for your time with us today. You bet. You guys take care. The views of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of MCV, its staff, or its board of directors, and we have a link to the work of the One Country Project in our show notes. A federal judge has ruled that President Trump was wrong to lift the government's ban on mining in greater sage-grouse habitat in 2017. District Judge Lynn Windmill of Idaho called the decision arbitrary and ordered the Bureau of Land Management to reconsider whether mining should be allowed. Sage grouse, known for their bizarre mating calls, are threatened species. Their numbers have dwindled in recent decades, mostly due to oil and gas development in western states. The American Prairie Reserve sent about three dozen bison from its property in Montana to tribes in South Dakota this week. American Prairie Reserve is an organization dedicated to protecting and restoring native grasslands across northeastern Montana. Over the past decade, it has sent hundreds of bison to tribes in western states. It's all part of an effort to restore genetically pure bison to indigenous nations. We'll leave you today with some pretty cool sounds from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll see the pictures too. These are simulated sounds of NASA's Perseverance rover landing on the planet Mars on Thursday. Perseverance hurtled into the Martian atmosphere at more than 12,000 miles per hour. Within seven minutes, the rover slowed down to a soft landing in a large crater. 
perseverance will look for signs of ancient microbial life and geology on the red planet. A good reminder that all we have for now is the good old blue and green planet. Let's take care of it. That does it for MCV Cast. Next week, we'll hear from the organization Protect Our Winters about the impact of climate change on Montana's and America's outdoor economy. We'll see you next week. Bye.